Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hey guys, this is Caleb from the Command Valley Podcast, coming at you with another episode of Duel of the Peaks. This is episode four, and with me is Griffin. Hi guys. Before we get started, just be sure to like this video and subscribe if you haven't. It's the easiest way, and it's free, to help support us and our channel, and we super appreciate it. Also, we want to give a huge shout out to this channel sponsor, GameGrid Lehigh. If you are in the Utah County area, be sure to check them out. They've got all of your commander needs. They've got a super friendly staff and they've got tons of other games and accessories there. So be sure to check them out. They are awesome. And we are super grateful for their support. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the episode. So for episode four, we have four of the five pre-con decks from Commander 2020. Oh yeah. So on this episode, Landon will be piloting the Arcane Maelstrom deck headed by Calamax the Storm Sire. Caleb will be piloting the Enhanced Evolution deck headed by Otrimi the Everplayful. Peter will be playing the Timeless Wisdom deck piloted by Gavi Nesswarden. And then me, Griffin, will be piloting the Symbiotic Swarm deck headed by Cathril Aspect Warper. Awesome, sounds super fun. As always with our Duel of the Peaks episode, we have challenges. For the table-wide challenges, we have four different points that you can get. Of course, you have three points if you win, three points if you have your commander out for three turns in a row, so that means three turn cycles, two points if you have 20 total power or more on board at any given point. This is to celebrate the fact that we are in Ikoria and there are big monsters, so we thought this would be the best way to celebrate the fact that there are tons of big monsters in these decks. And then lastly, one point if you cast one or both of your partner commanders. All right, let's move to the personal challenges and opening hands. Peter's personal challenge is to cycle seven cards during the game. Peter's opening hand was Esperia, Supreme Judge, Zenith Flare, Windfall, Rogren Crystal, an Island, an Izzet Boilerworks, and a Mystic Monastery. Caleb's opening hand was a Villainous Wealth, Genesis Hydra, Capricopian, Animist Awakening, Cold-Eyed Selkie, a Golgari Rot Farm, and a Mortuary Mire. Caleb's personal challenge is to mutate six times during the course of the game. All right, Griffin's opening hand consists of Abzan Ascendancy, Cataclysmic Gear Hulk, Nakara Lair Scavenger, Daring Fiend Bonder, Vitality Hunter, A Forest, and Myriad Landscape. And his personal challenge is to have six keywords in the graveyard at any given time throughout the game. And Landon's opening hand consists of two forests, two mountains, a Halimar Depths, Commune with Lava, and Decoy Gambit. His personal challenge is to copy six spells. Any of these personal challenges will be awarded two points upon completion. So watch out for those during the course of the game. And let's dive in. Landon will be starting this game. He begins his turn by drawing a card and playing a Halimar Depths, looking at the top three cards of his library and rearranging them in any order. Peter goes next, drawing his card for turn, playing an Island and passes. Caleb draws, plays a Dismal Blackwater, gaining one life and passes the turn. Griffin draws, plays his Myriad Landscape, and passes the turn. Nice. That'll search for two basics once he's able to untap it. Turn two, Landon draws, plays a Forest, and passes to Peter. Peter draws, plays his own Myriad Landscape tapped, and passes the turn. Caleb draws, plays a Darkwater Catacombs, and passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws, plays a Swamp, and with no further actions, passes the turn. Landon draws, plays a Swift Water Cliffs, gaining one life going to 41. Peter untaps, draws, plays a Plains, and on his main face, taps two mana, cracks the Myriad Landscape, and searches for two basic lands. I think it's awesome that they included the Myriad Landscape in these decks. Um, did they include it in all four of them, or in all five of them? I don't know. I, well, I if they so. did, if they did, then good on them, because that is a pretty good land. And it was getting up there in price. Caleb draws, plays a Forest, and plays Cold-Eyed Selkie. Ooh, that is a really good card for this deck. That's going to get him a lot of cards if he can successfully mutate Otrimi over it. That was definitely scary to see on the table, knowing that you were going to mutate, knowing that you had the potential to mutate Otrimi onto the Cold-Eyed Selkie next turn. Oh, yeah. Caleb passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws, plays a Forest, and passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws, 
plays a desolate lighthouse and taps four mana to play a solemn simulacrum, finding an island, and puts it onto the battlefield tapped. Peter Draws plays a mystic monastery, taps his mountain to cast a soul ring, then uses the soul ring and his remaining three mana and casts Gavi, Nest Warden. He has access to a lot of mana now after ramping with the Myriad Landscape and then the Soul Ring. That is looking pretty scary. Peter uses Gavi's ability to cycle the first card of the turn away for free, cycling a Chroma's Vengeance, drawing a card, and making a 2-2 Dinosaur Cat token. Caleb draws, plays a Command Tower, and just as we thought, mutates Otrimi onto the Selkie. I love that mutating creatures onto another creature that's already been out gives it kind of a pseudo haste there because that is a big swing. Caleb moves to combat, swings the Otrimi, mutated onto the Cold Eyed Selkie, and swings for 6 at Griffin. Griffin declares no blocks, takes 6, and goes down to 34. Once dealing damage, Caleb will draw 6 cards off of Otrimi because of the Cold Eyed Selkie. Yeah, that feels really good. Really good for a turn 4. On Caleb's end step, Griffin has game action. Tapping the mirrored landscape, his swamp and forest, searching for two planes and putting them onto the battlefield tapped. After Griffin searches for his two planes, Caleb moves to discard, discarding the Dream Tail Heron, Archipelago, Cavern Whisper, Genesis Hydra, and Capricopian. Griffin untaps his lands, draws for turn, plays down a forest, and taps his mana to cast an Acidic Slime. When Acidic Slime enters the battlefield, he will target the Soul Ring on Peter's board to destroy it. After that, Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps his lands, draws for turn, plays down a mountain. He taps three land to play a shiny impetus on Otrimi. So as with all of the impetus cards, it's going to give the creature that it's enchanted with a little bit of a buff, and then it forces that creature to have to attack every single turn, and it can't attack the owner of that impetus aura. And then when it does attack, the owner is going to get some sort of benefit as well, thus protecting themselves and also getting a small benefit. Peter untaps, draws. He has now had Gavi on the battlefield for one turn. He only needs two more turns to reach the challenge and get three points. Yeah, you'll see that these guys are keeping track of that using the dice next to their decks. So if you're wondering what those are, that was them keeping track and seeing how many turn cycles they've had their commanders out for. Plays down a planes, tap six mana to cast Esperia, Supreme Judge. Excellent play by Peter, causing not only the six commander damage marked on Griffin, but now Caleb is incentivized not to attack Peter because then he will get to draw a card. Peter moves to combat, swinging two damage with his dinosaur cat at Caleb. Caleb takes two and goes down to 39. Caleb untaps, draws. He has now had a tree me out for one turn as well. Caleb taps three, plays Propaganda, then as his land for turn plays a Golgari Rot Farm, returning Dismal Backwater to his hand. Caleb then goes to combat, swings Otrimi at Peter for 8. Len will get a treasure off of the impetus. And since Otrimi now has Island Walk because of the Cold Eyed Selkie, Peter cannot block, and Peter takes 8, going to 32. Caleb will then draw 8 cards from the Cold Eyed Selkie dealing damage, and also trigger on Otrimi, returning Archaeopaleagor to his hand from his graveyard. Caleb goes to discard, rediscarding Archaeopaleagor, Soft Tusk Demolisher, and a lot of lands. Yep. That is a ton of cards to draw over the course of just two turns. 12. 14 cards. 14. I can, yeah. I can math. We can math. <laughs> Griffin untaps, does not play a land, and casts Nikira Lair Scavenger. Nikira Lair Scavenger is one of the partner commanders inside of his deck, so he will get one point from the challenge. Ta ding Trigger on Nikara, pairing with Yannick. But Griffin elects not to search because Yannick is already in his hand. Oh, yep, he drew it that turn. I did draw it that turn. <laughs> that was just a bad feeling. I'm like, this could have been another card and I could also have Yannick. But yep. you know what? Whatever. <laughs> Griffin then casts Abzan Ascendancy. When Abzan Ascendancy enters the battlefield, he puts a plus one, plus one counter on each creature he controls, putting a plus one, plus one counter on his Acidic Slime and Nikara Lair Scavenger. On Griffin's end step, Lennon responds by casting a Decoy Gambit, targeting... Esperia, Otrimi, and Nakira. Everybody elects not to bounce their creatures, and Lannan gets to draw three cards. That's a pretty good draw three right there. That's really nice. For instant, or for two and a blue and instant, that pretty much says draw three. Yeah. It's a very nice card. Lannan untaps, draws, taps four mana to cast Rashmi, Eternity's Crafter. He then plays an Is It Boilerworks bouncing an island back to his hand. With no further actions, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps, draws his card for turn. He's now had Gavia on the battlefield for two turns. 
He cycles away a Vizier of the Tumbling Sands for free because of Gavi's ability. He then draws a card, creates a Dinosaur Cat token, plays Mountain for turn, then he taps 4 mana, casting Cast Out, targeting Otrimi. So this is an interesting piece of interaction here because what's going to happen is Caleb can elect to send Otrimi back to the command zone and the Cold-Eyed Selkie will still be exiled under the cast out. And something interesting about that is if Caleb can get rid of or if anyone gets rid of the cast out, then Cold-Eyed Selkie will come back by itself. And even though Otrimi went to the command zone, it remembers being exiled by the cast out. And with some really convoluted shenanigans with the rules, it would actually be it would actually come out of the command zone and into play as well. So with any mutate card, it would normally say it wasn't Otrimi, but some other mutate card, it would also usually get exiled under the cast out and both would just come back separately. But we just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that possible interaction. I also wanted to note that with that cast out, if the cast out is removed and Otrimi comes back onto the battlefield with Cold-Eyed Selkie, they will come back as two separate creatures no longer mutated. Correct. Caleb has no response. Alexa put Otrimi back to the command zone and the Selkai goes under the cast out that Peter has played. The shiny impetus will be removed and go to Landon's graveyard. Peter then taps the rest of his lands to play a windfall. Landon responds by casting Commune with Lava, triggering on Rashmi, gets a land on the top of his library, then exiles a forest off the top of his library with Commune with Lava. With no further game actions, everybody discards their hand and draws six because Landon had six cards in his hand. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps, draws, plays an exotic orchard, then taps two mana to play a Boneyard Mycodrax. He then mutates Migratory Greycorn on the bottom of the Mycodrax, searching for a basic land and putting onto the battlefield tapped, searching for a swamp. He then passes the turn to Griffin who untaps, draws, plays a Grim backwards. Griffin taps four lands and plays Tyam, Luminous Enigma. He then taps one mana to play a Soul Ring. Moving through combat, he passes a turn to Landon who draws, plays a forest from the commune with lava. He then taps his forest to play a soul ring, taps a forest and the soul ring to cast Glade Muse. He then taps four land and casts Kalamax, the Storm Sire. I just wanted to note Landon did forget triggers off of Rashmi. That was a game mistake on our part. Forgive us. We did find this out later. Lannan did start remembering the triggers. However, for this point in the game, we did forget the trigger. With that, Lannan moves to combat, passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws, getting three points off of the personal challenge to have their commander on the battlefield for three turns. Nice, that is a lot of points. Good job, Peter. Peter then casts new perspectives, drawing three cards, creating a dinosaur cat token. He then cycles Lonely Sandbar for free because of Gavi's ability, drawing a card. He then plays Hoofprints of the Stag. Moving right through combat, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untap, draws. Caleb then taps three land, casting Okima, Stalking Shadow, getting a point for casting his partner commander. When Okima enters the battlefield, it will trigger his partner ability. Caleb will then search his library for Sazerer, Ruthless Stalker, and bring it into his hand. Caleb then goes to combat, swings the Boneyard Mycodrax at Landon. Which is currently an 8-8 because of the amount of creatures in his graveyard. Landon then blocks with the Solemn Simulacrum. The Solemn Simulacrum will die, and Landon will draw a card. After combat, Caleb then taps three mana, casting a Parasitic Impetus on Tyam, giving him plus two plus two, goaded, and whenever he attacks, Griffin will lose two life, and Caleb will gain two life. On Caleb's end step, Griffin will respond by cycling away a Void Beckoner to give Tyam Death Touch. Peter also responds by cycling away a Hieroglyphic Illumination to draw a card. Griffin then untaps, draws. Griffin then taps 6 mana, casting an Ever After to return the Void Beckoner that he cycled away, and also Yannick, who was discarded from the Windfall. At this point, Griffin is now at 20 or more power this turn when Void Beckoner enters the battlefield and is awarded 2 points. When Void Beckoner and Yannick enter the battlefield, they both get Vigilance Counter because of Tyam. Yannick, when entering the battlefield, will exile the Acidic Slime, giving Yannick 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. Trigger off of Nikara, he will lose a life and draw a card. Griffin goes to combat, swinging time at Landon for 5. Declaring no blocks, Landon will take 5. Griffin will lose 2 from the Impetus and Caleb will gain 2. Griffin then plays a Cave of Coilos for his land for turn, and with that he will pass the turn to Landon. Landon untaps, draws a card, plays a Forest for turn. He then goes to combat and swings Kalamax at Caleb. 
Caleb responds with no blocks, and in response to that, Landon casts Hunter's Insight targeting Calamex. Because Calamex is tapped, the Hunter's Insight will gain a copy, allowing Landon to draw 10 total cards. This is great for Landon being able to draw that many cards because he was drawing almost absolutely nothing but lands that game. <laughs> So he's feeling pretty good about drawing all of those cards, and that was a great play with the Hunter's Insight. Landon will then tap four lands, casting a Wilderness Reclamation. He then taps two lands to cast a Lightning Greaves and immediately attaches them to Calamax. Moving through his turn, Peter responds by cycling two cards. He will then create another Dinosaur Cat. Peter has now cycled seven cards, attaining his challenge and gaining two points. Da ding good job. At Landon's end step, he will tap all lands and goes to, his di and goes to discard. He then shows off all the lands that he's discarding from the 10 cards that he drew. <laughs> this is a feel bad that can happen with the pre-cons. Happens to everybody, but Yes. But drawing that many cards to get past those lands probably felt really good. Peter untaps, draws a card, cycles away a Forgotten K for free. He will make another Dinosaur Cat. Peter's now hit 20 power on board as well and will get two points. He draws a card from cycling the Cycles of Forgotten Caves. Trigger on Hoofprints of the Stag. It will get a counter. He then casts Shiny Impetus, targeting the Void Beckoner. It's pretty crazy to see these pre-cons in action and having all of those Impetus cards flying around. It's just one more thing for each player to have to think about that there's another possible creature that is going to have to come at them. Peter then casts a Martial Impetus, targeting Ukima. Just so much goaded on the board. Peter then plays a Plains for turn. He then activates the Hoof Prince, removing the counters from it, making a 4-4 Elemental. He then passes without attacking and passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps, draws for turn, places Forest. He then taps four, casting Cesar, the Ruthless Stalker. Trigger on the partner, but Caleb will fail to search because Okima is already on the battlefield. Caleb goes to combat, swings Okima at Landon. Lennon responds with Growth Spiral, triggering the Glade Muse to draw a card. Also triggering Rashmi, he reveals the top card of his library. It's a channel of force. He puts that card into his hand. Calamax will trigger, copying the Growth Spiral, giving him another copy. He will then put a plus one plus one counter on Calamax because of Calamax's ability. Lennon will resolve the first one, drawing, playing a Mosswort Bridge. The second spiral resolves, he draws, does not get a land, and fails to put a land into play. He then will take three from Okima, going down to 33. Okima, after dealing damage, will get a plus one plus one counter from, from Sedzer. Caleb then taps four, casting a Souvenir Snatcher. That was one of the uh, rare mutate cards that actually costs more to mutate than actually play it. I think the majority of them cost less to mutate, but he probably would have really liked to have had enough mana to mutate that onto something and grab a grab an artifact like a soul ring. But it also helps to add to the board, so maybe that's what he was thinking. That's the interesting take on these games is that you're not just thinking about the best plays, you're also thinking about the plays that get you those points because that's the real thing that matters at the end of the game. Yep. Griffin responds to Caleb's end step by activating time, removing three counters from Yannick, milling three and gets a commander sphere from his graveyard onto the battlefield. Griffin untaps. In response to Griffin's upkeep, Landon casts Clash of Titans. Three triggers go on the stack. Because Calamax is tapped, Calamax will trigger, attempting to copy the Clash of Titans. Glade Muse will trigger because Landon casted an instant that was not on his turn, and Rashmi will trigger as well. Landon chooses to resolve Calamax first, giving him a plus one plus one counter and copying the Clash of Titans. With the Clash of Titans, he's targeting both Void Beckoner and Time to fight each other, and with the second, he has Void Beckoner and Yannick fight each other. Griffin responds to that by activating Tyam, removing th the rest of his counters from his creatures, including the Death Touch counter on Tyam. He will mill three cards into his graveyard and returns a Swiftfoot Boots to the battlefield with Tyam's ability. With no further actions, the spell resolves. Void Beckner will fight Tyam, killing Tyam. Tyam goes to the graveyard, and then Void Beckner will fight Yannick. Yannick will also die going to the graveyard. When Yannick dies, Acidic Slime will re-enter the battlefield, targeting the Wilderness Reclamation to destroy it. When Yannick and Tyam die, it will trigger Abzan Ascendancy, giving Griffin two spirit tokens. Lannan will then draw a card off of the Glade Muse, and he will also trigger Rashmi, getting an artifact mutation off the top of his library. Casting the artifact mutation, targeting the Swiftfoot Boots. Wow, that has got to be one of the craziest upkeeps of all time. That was a lot of stuff. Good job following along, everyone. <laughs> Griffin then continues his turn, drawing, playing a Swamp for turn. He then taps the Commander's Fear for a green and taps a Swamp. 
casting Secure Tri Builder. Griffin then taps the rest of his mana for eight, casting a Chroma Angel of Wrath. Whoo, that is a big angel. She's gonna bring a lot of damage to this board. She's got a complete and total keyword soup in her text box. That is a scary angel for the rest of the table to see. That's the exact kind of card that I want though. The problem with Cathril to this point is that I didn't have enough creatures that had more than one keyword. Ah, uh, yeah. So having an Akroma on the battlefield is almost worse than it being in the graveyard. Or is it good that it's not on the field? It's good that it's on the field, but it's also good if it's in the graveyard. Griffin then goes to combat, swinging the Void Beckoner at Landon. Trigger on the impetus, Peter will make a treasure token. Landon blocks with two sapperlings, dealing two damage to finish the Void Beckoner off, with the eight damage that was marked on him from the Clash of Titans. With no further actions, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws, plays a mountain, then casts Star Storm for eight, dealing eight damage to each creature. Trigger on Rashmi, Landon will look at the top card of his library, revealing a Primal Empathy, and casts it for free. So close. Caleb will not get that point. Caleb was super close to having 20 power on the board, and it looks like that is all about to change. In response to Landon casting the Star Storm, Griffin responds by sacrificing the Secure Tribe Elder, searching for a land putting onto the battlefield. Star Storm resolves everything dies except for a Chroma. Griffin will get two triggers off of the Abzan Ascendancy, creating two spirit tokens. You know what feels better than casting a Chroma? Keeping it. Keeping a chroma on empty board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Landon. Once the board is clear, Landon has no further actions and passes the turn to Peter. Upon remembering the trigger from Ukima, Caleb will deal four damage to Landon, but forget to gain the four life. Peter goes to his turn, untaps, draws, plays a crystalline resonance, and then also plays Chandra Flame Caller. Peter activates Chandra's plus one, making two three one elemental tokens. He then goes to combat and swings both elementals at Landon. Landon has no responses, no blocks, and takes six, going down to 23. Peter then plays a Boros Garrison for his land for turn, returning a mountain. Caleb untaps, draws, plays Croson Grip, targeting the cast out. Cold Eyed Silky and Atrimi will return. Atrimi from the command zone and Cold Eyed Silky from underneath the cast out. All right, so this is what we were talking about before. Now that the cast out is destroyed, Cold Eyed Selkie will come back from under it and Otrimi comes back from the command zone because cast out remembers that it cast out Otrimi. Caleb then plays a Blighted Woodland for his land for turn. Griffin untaps, draws, plays a together forever, putting a plus one plus one counter on both of his spirits because of support. Griffin then taps five of his lands, casting Cathril. Cathril will trigger and entering the battlefield, seeing Griffin's graveyard. Griffin has Menace, Death Touch, Trample, Lifelink, and Vigilance creatures in his graveyard. Griffin chooses to put the Lifelink and Trample counters on a Chroma and give Cathril the Menace, Death Touch, and Vigilance counters, and also five plus one plus one counters. Griffin then goes to combat, swings a Chroma at Chandra for six, taking Chandra out, and Griffin will gain six. Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws. He then taps for casting Crackling Drake. Crackling Drake will see that there are nine instant source sorceries in exile or in his graveyard, and he will have nine power. He then attaches the Lightning Greaves to the Crackling Drake. Landon then casts Channeled Force, discarding six cards. He will then deal six damage to the Cold-Eyed Selkie and draw six cards. Destroying the Cold-Eyed Selkie is a really good move here because all Caleb has to do is mutate another big creature onto it and swing. That thing's got Island Walk and he's going to draw a ton of cards, so it was a really good play from Landon here to destroy that Selkie. Selkie is a really good card in the Mutate deck. Landon then taps 3, playing a Psychic Impetus targeting Cathril. Griffin has no response and Cathril will be enchanted by the Psychic Impetus. Landon then goes to combat, swinging the Crackling Drake at Caleb, paying 2 for the propaganda. Caleb has no response and takes 10, going to 30. Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws, taps 7 to play Gavi for the second time. He then cycles Degree of Justice for free, however pays 5 into the X cost, creating 5 one, one soldiers. He also gets a Dinosaur Cat token because of Gavi. Then in response to cycling a card, he will have Crystalline Resonance become a copy of a Chroma. Peter then plays a Reliquary as his land for turn. Going to combat, he swings the Crystalline Resonance that is a copy of a Chroma at Landon. Landon will take 6, go to 17. On Peter's end step, Caleb cracks the Blighted Woodland to find an island and a swamp, putting them onto the battlefield tapped. Caleb untaps, draws. Caleb goes to combat, swings a Tremie at Landon for 6. Landon will take 6. Landon has no effects, no blocks, will take 6. 
trigger off of Otrimi, and Caleb will return Archipelagor to his hand from his graveyard. He then casts Vastwood Hydra. Caleb mutates Archipelagor onto the Vastwood Hydra. Trigger on mutate, he will target a Chroma to tap down. Griffin responds by using the Grim Beckwoods to sacrifice a Chroma. In response to that, he will use one generic to use Together Forever's ability. So when a Chroma dies, he will bring it back to his hand. A Chroma then goes to the graveyard because of Grim Backwoods. Griffin will then draw a card and return the Chroma back to his hand. Trigger on the Abzan Ascendancy, Griffin will make a spirit. While a Chroma is in the graveyard, Griffin hits his goal of having six keywords in his graveyard and is awarded two points. That's right, because it does have to hit the graveyard first before Together Forever allows it to return back to his hand. That was a very small instance of having all six of the keywords that you needed, but you got it. Griffin then goes to his turn. He untaps, draws, plays a swamp for turn. He then taps eight again to cast a Chroma. Griffin then goes to combat, forced to swing with Cathril because it is goaded. He swings a Coma and Cathril, both at Caleb, paying the four mana from Propaganda. Cathril has Menace, so Caleb cannot block it. He also chooses not to block a Chroma. In response, Lennon will scry two because of the impetus on Cathril. Caleb declares no blocks as no responses and will take 16 going down to 14. Griffin will then sacrifice his Commander Sphere to draw a card. With no further actions, Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps, draws, plays a Kessig Wolf Run. Landon will then cast Real Memoir, shuffling his instant and sorceries from his graveyard and having an opponent choose one at random. He has Peter choose. Peter chooses the Channeled Force and the Channeled Force will go back to Landon's hand. Because Surreal Memoir has Rebound, Lennon will be able to cast another copy at the beginning of his next turn. Lennon then plays the Channeled Force, discarding 4 cards to draw 4 cards, targeting one of the Spirit Tokens that Griffin has to deal 4 damage to it. Griffin has no response, and the Spirit will die. With no further actions, Lennon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps, draws, putting another counter on the Hoof Prince. He then activates the Hoof Prince to make a 4-4 Elemental. Peter then cycles Dismantling Wave for free, discarding a card and drawing a card, creating a 2-2 cat token from Gavi. Trigger on the Dismantling Wave, it will destroy all artifacts and enchantments. In response to cycling, Crystalline Resonance targets Chroma to copy it, so it is not an enchantment anymore. In response, Lennon casts Deflecting Swat, changing its target to Propaganda. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> Crystalline Resonance will become a copy of Propaganda and Dismantling Waved will destroy all artifacts and enchantments, including the Crystalline Resonance. Peter then casts Savai Thundermane and Cryptic Trilobite with three counters. Peter passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps, draws. Caleb goes to combat, swings Otrimi and Archaeopelagor at Landon. Landon chooses to block the Archaeopelagor with the Crackling Drake. He then responds by casting a Teamer Charm, giving the Crackling Drake a plus one plus one and having it fight Otrimi. Otrimi will die and the Crackling Drake will die. Archaeopelagor will survive, however, on Caleb's on Caleb's second main phase, he casts Gaze of Granite, x equal to 8, destroying everything with 8 mana or less. There is nothing on the board that costs more than 8 mana, so everything gets destroyed. Caleb then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws. Griffin taps 7, casting Cathril again. Griffin now has 7 different keywords in his graveyard. He puts all the counters and all the keywords onto Cathril, giving him Menace, Death Touch, Trample, Lifelink, Vigilance, First Strike, Flying, and also 7 plus 1 plus 1 counters. This is the point the the Cathril deck really starts to get crazy good when we're here in the late game and the graveyards are filled and it comes out with all of these counters, not to mention the plus 1 plus 1 counters. Things are probably looking pretty grim for everybody else. Griffin then casts a Seder Wayfinder getting a command tower and putting the rest into his graveyard. He then casts Netherborn Altar. He then exiles Daring Fiend Bonder from his graveyard to give Cathril an indestructible counter, completing the set. Cathril at this point now has Menace, Death Touch, Trample, Lifelink, Vigilance, First Strike, Flying, and Indestructible. Griffin then ends his turn, passing the turn to Landon. Landon untaps. Surreal Memory rebounds. Holding priority, he casts Dual Cast a Mage to copy it. This is now his third copy in the game. He has Peter randomly choose a card from his graveyard. Peter randomly chooses Clash of Titans. Then Landon casts Calamax. He passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps, draws, casts an Ethereal Forger, exiling a Chroma's Vengeance, Zenith Flare, Windfall, and Decree of Justice. He then casts Gavi for the third time. Wow. He has the mana for it though. Not worrying about it. Yeah, this late in the game, pretty much everybody has the mana for that. He then passes the turn to Caleb. 
Caleb untaps, draws, he then taps 3 to cast a Trumpeting Gnar. He then taps the rest of his mana to Mutate Utrimi on top of the Trumpeting Gnar, creating a 3-3 beast token. Caleb is now at 5 mutations. Just needs one more to get that personal goal and 2 points. He then passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, puts down his command tower, he then puts the predatory impetus on his own Cathril, making him a 13-13. Griffin then goes to combat, swings Cathril at Landon for 13. In response, Landon cracks the scavenging grounds to exile all graveyards. He then casts Tribute to the Wild, having every opponent sacrifice an artifact or enchantment. Griffin is the only one with an artifact, and he sacks the Netherborn altar. Landon takes 13 and goes to zero life out of the game. Then Griffin will gain 13 life and go to 50. Well, that's it for Landon. Yep. First to go out. He had some pretty powerful plays though. Yeah, being able to copy the cards like Clash of Titans was really powerful. Uh, we saw some seriously good moves from, and some smart moves from Landon uh, when he chooses to remove, for example, the Selkie. All in all, he did a great job. I think he just hit too many lands. He was telling us throughout the game that there was a lot of lands he was drawing from the Channeled Forces. Even though Lennon was a big factor in this game, removing the the Void, the Void Beckoner, the Void Beckoner, yeah. Tyam, and Nikara all on the same turn, also getting rid of the Selkie and having a lot of interaction and and positive influence in the game. Yeah, despite being flooded with mana, he did an absolutely fantastic job piloting that Kalamax deck. Good job, Landon. We're gonna miss you. Rip in peace. Then Griffin on his second main face taps seven mana and casts a Hornet Queen, getting four. Insect tokens with flying and death touch. Griffin then passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps, plays an island, goes to combat, swinging the Ethereal Forger at Caleb. Peter chooses to get their Chromus Vengeance back off of the trigger from the Ethereal Forger, getting one of the instant or sorceries he exiled under the Ethereal Forger. Caleb decides not to block since he doesn't have flying, and takes three. Peter then casts the Chromus Vengeance, destroying all creatures, artifacts, and enchantments, removing the predatory impetus off of Cathro and removing every creature other than Cathro because he has Indestructible. I would have liked to have those insects with flying and death touch around. It's good defense, honestly. It's amazing defense. Yeah, that was a really good move from Peter, even though they had to sacrifice a little bit of Caleb's life against the 50 life that Griffin still has left. It was worth it to clear away some of those insects and the impetus. Caleb then goes to his turn, untapping and drawing. He then plays a Tidal Barracuda. With no further actions, he passes the turn over to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, plays Karametra, God of Harvests. He then goes to combat, swinging Cathril at Caleb. Caleb has no response because Cathril is in the air, and Caleb will take 10, and Griffin will gain 10, going to 60. He then passes the turn over to Peter. Peter untaps, draws, and uses 11 mana to cast Gavi, Nest Warden, for the fourth time. Wow. Gotta get those free cycles off. It's worth it. <laughs> With no further actions, he passes the turn. In response to Peter's end step, Griffin casts a Cartographer's Hark. So Griffin is able to cast that because of the new card, Tidal Barracuda, which is a really cool and political card that gives everybody else basically a Vidalcan Orrery except for on the owner of Tidal Barracuda's turn. So pretty interesting. It can nice. protect you against some sticky removal or counter spells that are coming your way at the cost of giving everybody else flash. Yeah, it's pretty good though. In response to that, Griffin also casts an Angel of Finality. When Angel of Finality enters the battlefield, he will exile Peter's graveyard. Griffin then will resolve the Karametra triggers and search his library for a forest and a plane. After all that, Caleb responds by casting a Putrefy to kill the Angel of Finality. Caleb then goes to his turn, untapping his lands and drawing. He then mutates Utrimi onto the Tidal Barracuda. Just in time to get those two points. That's his sixth mutate. That is, that is Caleb's sixth mutate. Yeah, good thing for that one life or else he wouldn't have been able to do it. <laughs> That's what we call at the, the last moment. Yes. Hanging on by the thread. Yep. Getting those two points. Skin of his teeth. Caleb then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin will get three points for having Cathril out for three turn cycles. He then goes to combat and swings Cartographer's Hawk at Caleb for two, taking him out with the bird. How does that feel? That felt pretty good, especially after you threw a Putrefy at my angel. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter is all alone facing down probably the most heinous monster we have ever seen on this show and quite the life total. And with that, Caleb is out of the game. Yeah, at least he got two points. Griffin also swings 10 at Peter with Cathro. Peter will take 10 going to 22 and Griffin will go to 70. 
Caleb definitely had the strongest start of the deck. The most powerful part of it was when Caleb was able to cast a Otrimi onto a Cold-Eyed Selkie, allowing him to not only have Island Walk, but when he dealt damage to a player, he would draw cards equal to the damage he dealt, which was 6 with Otrimi. Over the course of 2 turns, he drew 14 cards on turn 5. Yeah, by turn 5, being able to draw 14 cards, that is just incredible card advantage and card selection. It, that's honestly what kept Caleb in the game for so long, was that really, really quick start. It was really sad to see that Selkie go away twice, but it definitely did work. Um, Mutate is really fun, and it's a really interesting mechanic. There are a lot of things that you can do with Otrimi to make him way more powerful than he than he seems just on the face of the commander box. You can throw him on something with Hexproof, Indestructible, or a really good ability like the Cold-Eyed Selkie, which was a great include in this pre-con and just make an absolute beast out of that commander. I will say that Caleb piloted the Otrimi deck extremely well. Thank you. You're welcome. Griffin then goes to his end step and passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws, plays a Lightning Rift for turn, and passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, plays an Arcane Signet, then goes to combat, swinging Catherell at Peter for 10. Peter goes to 12, and Griffin will go up to 80. He then passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps, draws, plays an Eternal Dragon, a creature with flying. That's exactly what he needed. That is exactly what Peter wants to see, even though it's looking pretty hopeless right now, but he might be able to hold off for a bit. At this time, we, we all think it's over. Griffin has the confidence that he's going to be able to take Peter out of this game. On Peter's end step, Griffin casts Blood Curdle, targeting the Eternal Dragon. Peter counters with a Neutralize. Very nice move there. Griffin then goes to his turn, untaps, plays a Golgari Rot Farm. He then goes to combat, swinging Catherell at Peter for 10. Peter goes to 2. Griffin goes to 90. Hey guys, it's Peter, the editor. Just wanted to make a quick note that at this point in the game, I should have lost due to Catherell dealing more than 21 points of commander damage to me. However, when we recorded the episode, we did not observe this rule and we continued to play. We've decided to leave it all in, and we hope you enjoy the remainder of the match. He then passes the turn back to Peter. Peter draws, praise Brawlin, getting one point for casting one of his partner commanders. And that's why in a game of Duel of Peaks, you don't just quit, because there are always more points to be had. The trigger on Brawlin, he will search his deck for Shabraz, and then cast Shabraz. He then passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, plays a Sandstep Citadel, goes to combat, and swings Catherell at Peter for 10. Peter responds by giving Brawlin flying according to his ability. He then blocks with all three. Griffin chooses four Shabraz and Eternal Dragon to take the damage. Shabraz and Eternal Dragon will die, and Griffin will gain 10 and go to 100. He passes the turn back to Peter. Peter returns Eternal Dragon to his hand at his upkeep. He then cycles the Desert of the True drawing a card, making a cat dino from Gavi. Brawlin triggers, adding a plus one plus one counter and dealing one damage to Griffin. Lightning Rift triggers, dealing two damage to Griffin. Griffin is now at 97. Hey, this is a start. Peter is holding Griffin off and he's doing a good job, even though he's only at two life. And like I said, this is why you don't ever just quit. This is why you don't just scoop there. It's a long shot, but Peter has a shot. It doesn't look very great. He's only got two life, but he could come back from this. I've, I've seen people come back from games like this. Peter then cycles the Desert of the Fervent, drawing a card. Brawlin triggers, adding a plus one plus one counter and dealing another damage to Griffin. Then Lightning Rift will trigger, dealing two more damage to Griffin, putting him at 94. Peter then smiles like a little boy on Christmas, who has just gotten the tricycle of his dreams, casting Descend Upon the Sinful to exile all creatures, getting that card off of the top of his library, Exiling Catherell. Oh, you guys would not believe what is going on around that table right now. We are all so surprised at that. I don't. I didn't even know that that was in the deck. That was awesome. That was just the card that Peter needed to keep Griffin at bay and to be able to maybe even pull a land in and come back from two life. We'll have to see what happens here. At this point, I am actually feeling a little bit worried because I don't have enough in my... I don't have Indestructible anymore. I can't give him Hexproof. Another removal spell, and it's going to be hard to cast Cathril again. This, this, this game could very easily turn the other way. Yeah, it's been a crazy long game too, so it's just... This is a pretty incredible turn of events, I'm not going to lie. 
After casting Descend Upon the Sinful, Peter will not have Delirium, so he will not get the Angel. He passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, plays Cathro. He now has Flying and Death Touch in his graveyard, so he will get Flying and Death Touch counters onto Cathro and two plus one plus one counters. He then, he then searches his library for a land from Karametra and then passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws, casts Eternal Dragon, and then passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, and draws the most perfect card. If Peter got to draw the most perfect card, Griffin also got to draw the most perfect card. <laughs> yep. Griffin then casts Dune Blast, choosing one creature and destroying the rest, keeping Cathril and destroying the Eternal Gra Dragon. He then goes to combat and swings at Peter for five, taking him out. Great job, Griffin. That was the perfect draw for him because Peter could have kept bringing back that Eternal Dragon and keeping Griffin at bay like he's been doing for the last few turns. And that was exactly what Griffin needed to close out the game. That was a wonderful job from the Cathril deck and great job piloting it. Thank you, Caleb. Yeah. That means a lot to me. It was really fun to watch. I think the craziest part of the game was definitely Cathril, not just because it won, but just seeing a creature with that many counters on it, that many ability counters was just so cool. I love the new mechanic that we got with this set and with the, the new Ikoria set. I will say it was a lot more fun than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't too keen on the keywords until I casted Cathril and he had seven of them. <laughs> and then crazy. he was just like drowned in keywords. Yep. And I don't know, it felt good, especially when I was able to give him indestructible and I just felt powerful. Nice. I just felt on this board of no other creatures, I am the biggest, baddest insect. That is awesome. And, and again, I, I really liked watching Peter. I don't think that Peter was just dirtling around. I think he was serious. Um, and I think that that's how you should always be. Even when you're on the ropes, Peter did a great job of keeping the Cathro back and controlling the game. And he got, and Griffin got very lucky with that Doom Blast. So great job, Peter. Rest in peace. Griffin, congratulations. You have won two Duel of the Peaks in a row, right? Yep, so that puts me at two and Lennon at two. I definitely think that Peter was a very powerful force. I mean, there were times that I was looking over the table and, and Caleb, Lennon, and I were kind of beating on each other, swinging at each other, and Peter was over there creating an army of dinosaur tokens that, dinosaur cat tokens that really could have easily taken our life down pretty pretty quickly but it, 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 he played very well playing defensively waiting until he had a good finisher to take us all out unfortunately it was just it was just not enough to to hold back an indestructible 10 10 creature yeah you definitely can't discount those little tokens even though they're just two twos with the cycling deck peter was able to create them so quickly and so many in just a short amount of time that he could have easily overrun the board if it weren't for all the many board wipes that happened all right then let's go ahead and count out points at the end of the game landon who was out first did not achieve any of the challenges unfortunately and it remains with zero points leaving landon at a total of eight points for the season caleb out next was able to mutate six time giving him two points he was also able to cast one and both of his partner commanders giving him another point for a total of three points combined with his last score caleb is now at 11 points for the season all right and peter who played until the very end was able to cycle seven cards getting him two points for his personal challenge. He was also able to get one point off of casting both of his partner commanders. He got two points for having 20 total power on board, and he got three points for having his commander out, which is a total of eight more points, putting him at 16 total points for the season overall. Wow, that was a lot of points. Some really impressive plays from Peter, great job. And Griffin, who ended the, our last episode at 13 points, was able to win, obviously, netting him three more points. He, of course, had his commander out for three turn cycles, which net him another three points. He did get 20 total power on board during the game, which is two more points. And he was able to cast his partner, and he definitely had more than six keywords in his graveyard at one point, netting him all the possible points once again that he could get, totaling 11 more points, putting him at a whopping 
an absolute whopping 24 points for the season. I think everyone is going to have to play Arch Enemy in our next episode and take this guy down. It is absolutely crazy that Griffin is at 24 freaking points. <laughs> Good job, dude. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is honestly pretty terrifying for me. <laughs> I didn't expect to win this game or get that many points, and now I'm very worried for next game. All right, with that, guys, that is it for the gameplay video. Thank you so much for watching and waiting till the end. We appreciate it so much, and we hope you enjoyed this game as much as we did. Once again, if you are not already subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe. We very much appreciate everyone who subscribes to our channel, and if you haven't already as well, please like this video. Once again, thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video and for giving us opportunity to be able to play these decks. If you're in the Utah County, be sure to go check them out. They've got a super friendly staff and all of your commander magic needs and a lot of other things for any other games that you're into. And that will be all from us today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much, guys. We super appreciate you. Have a good one. Okay, I didn't throw it, but I... Oh, oh Peter, Peter did. did. <laughs> do you see that? Let's... Peter, can you just do that in slow motion? <laughs> this is a Caleb and Peter problem, apparently. Yeah. Did you see how nicely... Let's let's slow-mo how nicely I put that <laughs> blood curdle on his creature, and instead it was just like... If you're going to neutralize it, if you're going to cast neutralize, you actually have to physically cast it like that. Yeah, though, you got to like. throw it from your hand. I, I think that Peter made the right move by casting it. I think like so. That. It's not just the card. It's yeah. about it's about your, your standing. He's a planeswalker. He has to throw the spell. Exactly. Like a normal planeswalker. It's a just guy. Just exactly. guy. Yeah. <laughs>
Make a stand. Make your point. Uh, it's a power play. That's what it was. Yeah. He not only countered my spell, like he countered my feelings. That was a really, really deep and good play from Peter. For that sure. was exceptionally good. We I don't think. Stop. I don't think there's a play that I've ever seen that's better than this. <laughs> that. I was gonna quit the game. No, you weren't. Yeah. No, you weren't. You broke my spirits. That, that neutralized. Was the most powerful neutralize I've dug ever seen. Deep <laughs> into my heart. Wow. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Moving on. <laughs>